Hello all, and thank you for all coming up to this session. This is a huge room with a lot of people. It's quite intimidating being the little person down the front here. Well, what I'm going to talk about today is designing software for performance. And it's not what many people think. It's actually something much simpler. A lot of people will think it's all about compiler bit tricks and all that sort of stuff. This, I want to take it back to think about it in a different way. So kind of start off with the question here. Who thinks it is difficult to design software that has good performance? Few people? I see a lot of people think it must be fairly easy. Well, I think it particularly is if you do a lot of this. So if we just copy and paste everything from Stack Overflow, we probably don't even understand what we're doing in the first place. I think probably a slightly bigger problem is resume-driven development. Many of us end up, we just try things and we try to put them on our CVs or resumes and that's why we tend to do a lot of things, kind of not particularly for the right reasons. Something that's worth bearing in mind, there's a paper came out last year, if anybody hasn't read this, I would recommend going and doing this. This is where the silicon industry get together and they discuss trends and where things are going for the future. There were some really fundamental things that came out of this report. So when this came out, one of the things that it highlighted is we are using more and more energy in our data centers, and this is increasing at quite an alarming rate. How alarming is this actually? Well, by 2040, if we continue on our current trends, there will not be enough energy produced on the planet to feed our data centers. Think about that for a second. So when we're writing all of our code, maybe parsing all that XML and JSON and sort of burning energy and heat, thinking about why are we doing it that way? Is there different ways of doing this? So we've gone through a world of whereby for years we'll be able to say, let's just throw uh, hardware at the problem. And if we throw hardware at the problem, it's going to kind of be OK. And we did kind of get away with that because as Moore's Law continued, we tended to get increasing clock speeds. That has stopped now. But we then went on, we could get increasing transistor density, which is still happening to an extent, but slowing down greatly. We're now reaching the point whereby economics is going to drive our future and not the physical side of the world. And let's look at what that actually means and should we actually care about performance. So I want to go back to the start and look at well, what does it mean to design for performance at a kind of fundamental level and what can we do? So I'm going to answer that sort of fundamental question. What's the structure of this going to be? Well, let's spend a little bit of time talking about what performance is itself. How do we actually end up doing this? Well, a lot of it's about making clean and representative models, and I'll get into that in a little bit of detail. Then I'll go into how do we actually implement those models themselves, and then how do we test this to prove that it actually works? So let's start off with what is performance itself. We often hear, let's make this fast. Let's just make it go quicker. But what does that really mean? Performance is a very high level concept. We need something much more concrete we're going to deal with. So one of the ways we can look at performance is throughput. And throughput is units of some work done per unit of something of time. And we'll often hear the term bandwidth. Well, bandwidth is maximum throughput at a given level. So if your network can do 10 gigabits per second, that is the maximum throughput you'll get. So you'll hear bandwidth and throughput used that sort of way. It's a really interesting measure, so it's one of the things that we should be going for. It also matters what the response time is for many different things. So we deal with throughput, but what is the response time at a given throughput is really interesting. So if we test something at a low amount of throughput, sometimes we can get a good response time. If we increase the throughput, response time can go wrong. And I want to get into why that kind of happens and what we can do about keeping things responsive. Because any system that doesn't respond in a timely manner is effectively unavailable. So we need to look at both of these measures. We'll also look at a lot of things like scalability. So this isn't strictly performance, but it ends up being very related. And as we look at things like scalability, what we mean by this is if I add a proportional amount of a resource, do I get a proportionate increase in throughput or do I get a proportionate disc, uh, decrease in response time? And we need to be able to deal with these. So if I add hardware to a problem and things get slower, that is not a scalable system. It should scale up, but there's some fundamental mathematics behind that. Now, a lot of performance can actually be summarized in things like this. So this is a lot of my life. I travel around a lot. I end up in queues. 
Given what's been happening in the world this year, I probably don't want to travel quite as much in the future because I get a hard time from immigration in different places. But as we stand in these queues, we start thinking, well, how does this actually give me an idea of performance? Well, there's a number of things going on here. This comes down to how we break things down. Queuing theory is fundamental to so much of what performance is about. It's actually some very simple arithmetic and probability behind it, but it really explains a lot of what's going on. So if we're dealing with a system like this, what is your response time is kind of interesting. What is latency? What is service time? What is cycle time? You hear all these different terms. Some of them are actually the same thing, the same name for it, uh, two different names for the same thing. Some things are fundamentally different. So the major things that really matter in a system like this is what is the service time or cycle time? They're actually the same thing. That is the time you're at the front of the queue getting serviced at the desk. That is the time you're being serviced. That will be your service time. That starts to matter. And by getting service time down, we can make systems a lot more responsive because they feed into what is response time, and that's the total time for the system, which is made up of service time plus the wait time that you're dealing with something. If you're waiting in the queue for a long time, it's not a pleasant experience, yet a lot of our software has a lot of these problems because we end up waiting in queues for something to happen. We can open many other queues so that we can get more throughput, we can go parallel. The parallel side's kind of interesting, has some issues with it as well. What's this look like if we start throwing a lot of load at a system? What happens to the response time? Well, you'll have seen sort of J curves like this before, where as we increase load on a system, the response time starts to slow down. It doesn't slow down linearly. This is what's quite interesting about it. There's probability theory coming into play here. And what we've got here is a graph of response time versus utilization. This is typical queuing system. As utilization is low, response time is fairly good. But as utilization starts to ramp up, response time starts to get quite poor, and then starts to go poor really badly very quickly towards the end. So what's kind of going on here? What do I mean by utilization? So say this is a service, and that service can process a request in 100 milliseconds. And if things are turning up at five per second, you're using up 500 milliseconds off the time of that service. It's actually 50% utilized. It's fairly responsive at that time because there tends to not be queues forming. As you start to increase the arrival rate, so things arriving at a faster rate, say six a second, seven a second, eight a second, whatever it happens to do, you're taking the utilization up. And once you start going over about 70% utilization, response time starts to get bad really, really quickly. Like, so what can we do about this sort of thing? Well, we could limit the rate of arrival, which we typically don't want to do with our applications. We want to deal with this in a better way. And the better way to deal with that is to reduce the cycle time or the service time. By reducing that, we greatly reduce utilization. So let's say in this case, we were running at 90% utilized. The queue will typically be 10 deep at that stage, so that's a long time to be waiting to get your service. If you were to optimize that service so it runs in 50 milliseconds now rather than 100 milliseconds, it's going to make this thing much less utilized. So you're going to half the utilization, so we go from 90% down to 45%, and actually a unit of processing is half of that again. So we're in a really good situation where now, rather than queuing for 10 plus units of time, we're down to queuing for just over half a unit of time. That's a factor of 20 improvement in the response time of a system because you change the service just by making it twice as fast as before. So some of these fundamentals start to really matter. So what does this actually mean for us? Well, if we keep capacity sufficient so that we keep utilization down, we can have quite responsive systems. This applies to all systems. So any project managers in the room, this equally applies to you. If you run your teams at very high utilization, you will not get good response from them because their system, just like everything else, governed by the same mathematics. We need to think about this. So can we go parallel to speed up? In the picture I showed, we can have multiple queues, and those queues will allow us to get through the work faster. But this comes down to, can we split this piece of work up? If you look at this sort of area, you'll come across Amdahl's law quite quickly. Most people know of it. 
Amdahl's law wasn't coined by Gene Amdahl himself. He wrote a paper called Amdahl's Argument. And the whole point of this paper is he wanted to scare people off using mid-range systems. So the guy who actually wanted to stop people doing parallel programming gets associated with it. Welcome to the modern world. He didn't want us doing this. What, what was his argument? What was he trying to achieve? Well, what he's trying to show is how difficult it is to make something parallel to get a scale up. So let's say I've got a job, and that job can be split up into a part A and a part B. If I can throw four processors at the problem, I can get a reasonable speed up in this because I can split up the part A and do it in parallel over four different processors. If part B was the only bit I could split to run across those four processors, my speed up is much more modest. I can get so much more out of this. How does this look when we start looking at what percentage of an algorithm can be done in parallel? If we look at this, if it's really simple, and it say, for example, half of the job can be done in parallel, half of it still needs to be sequential at this stage, you can only ever get a two-act speed up. It doesn't matter how many processors you throw at it, you still can't go more than sort of halving the time to doing this, so we get the two-act speed up. If we look at it as it goes further up, so even up to the extreme of a job that is 95% can be paralyzed, you still cannot get more than a 20x speed up. So it's actually quite a grim situation to look at. Going to parallel, if you have any contention at all, becomes a limiting factor very, very quickly. And this is what Amdahl's argument was. He didn't want you going buying these mid-range computers because he didn't believe it was easy to program for them and you should have bought his mainframes. But that was an argument just to scare people. What's it like when you look at this from a real-world perspective so when Neil Gunther was at Xerox Park, he was looking at parallel computing at the time, and he was finding you couldn't get Amdahl's uh, scale-up predictions. In fact, you couldn't even get close to that when things got interesting. And he dug into it a lot more. And as a result of that piece of work, he came up with something called universal scalability law. Kind of slightly scary formula, but it's actually not that difficult when you get your head around it. What he discovered was that Whereas Amdahl was right about the contention part of the penalty, he did not cover the coherence cost that's involved. So when you've got multiple parties all communicating and they're sharing work, they need to communicate between each other what their current state of the world is. That has a coherence penalty. So everything takes time. Nothing happens in an instant, even between processors on the same socket. There still is a time penalty getting the state and each of the caches coherent. This, this needs to be factored in. So let's take the 95% case, and then with the 95% case, I'm going to add in a coherence penalty of 150 microseconds. This is typically what you would see in your sort of Amazon clusters if you were doing a, a large Hadoop job. How do things scale up? It's, sort of, it's my world, the sort of things I get to see quite often. Well, the blue line is Amdahl's case. So we're looking at that nice speed up. We can eventually get to a 20x speed up if we throw lots of processors at the problem. But you factor in the 150 microsecond coherence penalty, and all of a sudden, the speed up isn't looking so good. It's kind of fine when you're in the small numbers of nodes that you're applying this to, but as soon as you pass about 16, the two curves start to diverge. And then after a while, the coherence penalty not only is having a minor impact, it's actually becoming the major factor, and you slow down rather than speed up. So we cannot escape these problems easily. This is simple mathematics that will hunt us down, and we cannot run away from it. So if we have any contention in our algorithms, we are fundamentally limited in how we scale up. Now here's a nice little graph. What we've got here is multiple threads going at a problem, and time to complete. So what is the wait time to, to finish doing this job? And we're seeing that it's right about sort of 17 microseconds per operation when we've got one thread doing something. We add more threads to this, and it's taking longer to complete. Does this look like it's a fairly parallel job? And do we think this has got good scalability? Someone's thinking, yeah. So much like, so 
if two threads are going to do this, it, taking even longer. So what, what you're seeing here is a perfect queue for me. Things are joining the queue as you add processors. You've got a contention penalty here of 100%. This is like the worst scale-up algorithm you can imagine. What do you think that is? That's our logging frameworks. Pretty much every one of them works this way. They take a great big lock, and that serializes everything that goes through the logging. So the more cores you apply to the problem, the slower it gets. The more you increase contention, and that all has to be made coherent, the number of systems I get to see where people are just bottleneck on logging. And you really don't even need to pick out any logging frameworks. They all suffer from the same thing. It's a kind of really bad design pattern. Like, if anybody wants to build highly scalable systems, I recommend you study logging systems and then do completely the opposite. You've got some hope of making a scalable system or high-performance system at that stage. So, with that in mind, let's kind of go forward. Let's look at what can we do, how should we be thinking about things, just even at a very, very simple level. So let's look at clean and representative. I love getting the dictionary out when we go to name things, because our industry is just riddled with things named really, really badly. I love things like random access memory. Do you want memory to give you random values back? No, you want arbitrary access. Whoever named that, did they not look up the dictionary? non-functional requirements, the list is kind of endless. So let's look at what it means by being clean, because we're talking about the clean code movement a lot. Well, morally uncontaminated, pure, innocent. Whose code is like that? It's morally uncontaminated, pure, and innocent. Wouldn't it be wonderful if our code was? Most of the code's kind of very unclean and really not that nice. So I'm kind of all behind the clean code movement. Please, can we have some of this? Also, what does it mean to be representative? Well, it should be serving as a portrayal of something, a symbol of something. So our code should actually state its intent to be really quite clear. And if you kind of start following these things, it kind of plays out in an interesting way. I love the fact that code is the one thing that will always be running on your project. So documents get out of step, comments get out of step. The code is the place where we should capture our understanding. And we should keep it alive, we should constantly keep keep updating it, like gardening, we attend it all the time. And if we do, we kind of get to some of the right things. Now, if code is really that important, that should mean that some of our design approaches really, really matter. So this is the bulk of what I want to talk about here, is like how we do design really impacts so many different things. You could go on about clean code, you could go on about maintainability, testability, all the different quality attributes. But I spend a lot of time on performance, and I find that Clean, simple code tends to also be the most performant code, so it has to follow good design principles. So let's look at some of those design principles. One of the ones I keep hearing a lot is people talking about abstraction. And abstraction is one of those kind of fascinating subjects that I've got a, a very simple way of looking at it now. I've got my rules of abstraction. So rule number one, don't do abstraction. Rule number two, don't do abstraction. <laughs> Getting a little bit fight club here is, sort of joking aside, being a bit more serious, we can abstract, but we should be seeing at least three things that are something. Like, if we're going to have inheritance, for example, using polymorphism, we should have a proper is-our relationship, not a kind of sort of maybe a bit like that sort of thing because it's sort of convenient for me right now. We need genuine is-our relationships. Then we can treat things in a sensible, sane sort of way. And all abstractions have a cost. Everything we do has a cost. Does it pay back for the cost of doing it? It's some really simple things we need to think about. So if we're going to start doing abstraction, let's be clear why we're doing it. We've got a genuine is our relationship if we're just talking about polymorphism here. And the abstraction is going to pay for itself. The one thing to be very aware of is our industry got very obsessed by dry for a long time. So don't repeat yourself. Dry out your code. Make sure you don't have that commonality. It's kind of interesting how it's often better if you're going to implement something new is even copy and paste. Now, I know that sounds like heresy, but copy and paste, try, change the code, do what you need it to do exactly, then maybe start thinking about drying it out afterwards. 
We shouldn't abstract before. We should always abstract later. Whenever we know we're going to get the benefits, the danger is we rush to these things, we build our cathedrals, and we then find it so difficult to go back again. If you've got to look at basic human behavior, if you've created this thing that's been a work of many years or many months or whatever it's been, it's really hard to undo it. It's much better to keep it simple, work out for commonality, then create it later. It's, just, it's the order that we go into it. Because if we go down this route, we're into a kind of interesting world where as soon as you've got many of a certain type, we're now into megamorphism. And this is one of the things that our compilers on our hardware has quite a lot of difficulty dealing with. So if we've only got one of something, it's fairly easy. Even two of something, we can deal with it quite well. Once you start dealing with three plus of something, it becomes really difficult. So we end up with jump tables. There's certain optimizations we can do, but it becomes quite limited. This doesn't suit how our modern processors work. So if we're going to do it, we've got to get a payoff for it. Otherwise, it's not worthwhile. And also, if it's not representative, it's kind of the wrong thing to be doing. There's so many abstractions that are just plain wrong where we try to create these. I'll kind of come back to this a little bit. I found one of the biggest things that stands out in this is big frameworks. Is everybody wants to sell you a big framework that's going to solve all of your problems, but generally it doesn't. All of these big frameworks are usually just a promise that never delivers. The truth is we just need to do a lot of hard work ourselves and kind of get to that point. And I see understanding what's important I think this is actually a really good example of this. So if you're ever into backpacking or traveling around, you'll meet the individuals who start off and they want to bring everything. They think then all the stuff, and actually they're proud of all of their stuff. But you very quickly start to realize there's only a certain number of things you really need, and that way you can travel much lighter. It should be the same with our code. The less code we have, the easier it is to maintain, the easier it is to deal with, the easier it is to reason about, the easier it is to make it fast. So we've got to keep it simple. We've got to start thinking of how do we travel light. So if we're going to start abstracting, only abstract when we're sure of the benefits. So let's just pick on to that a little bit more. So who's heard of Joel Spolsky's Law of Leaky Abstractions? So probably quite a few people. He makes a couple of interesting statements in this. Like all non-trivial abstractions are to some extent leaky. The detail of underlying complexity cannot be ignored. This is how he talks about it. To me, this is just screaming out that this is not an appropriate abstraction. This is someone has abstracted for the wrong reasons. Let's look at how someone else describes abstraction. Back in 1972, when Dijkstra accepted his Turing Award, in the middle of his speech, he had this little gem. The purpose of abstracting is not to be vague, but to create a new semantic level in which one can be absolutely precise. I much prefer that to Joel Spolsky's view of it. It's basically showing us that abstractions can be good, but only when you're giving you more precision, not whenever it's sort of papering over the cracks of something that's imperfect. So let's try and make a concrete example of this. So I spend a lot of time dealing with memory systems and hardware, and they're fascinating, complicated beasts. But can we actually abstract what they do to understand what they give us? Well, our hardware friends basically take three bets. They're betting that we're going to write software following three very simple rules. One is the temporal bet. It's something that you've used recently, you will use again in the near future. This is what most people do understand about caches. It's a fairly simple thing, so the least recently used type concept. What's more interesting is things like the spatial bet. So things that are used to are things that are together are typically used together. So we got to keep things close together. This is about cohesiveness, so sort of the absolute opposite of coupling and getting this sort of thing right. So how does this play out? For example, if you have an object, two fields in that object are likely to be right next to each other when how you lay out the class or that object for the class. They're likely to be in the same cache line. That way you get the benefit of it's only a single access to memory. You're going to be hitting the same cache line in your L1 cache. So they're following those bets. Same with slightly larger structures, like things appearing in the same operating system page table, which means that part is hot in the cache where we translate our virtual physical addresses. There's all sorts of interesting layers to this, but it's actually got some nice abstractions in it. And if we understand those and we follow them, we can get benefits. The third one, quite simple, is that 
they take a bet on patterns of access. They're expecting us to access our data structures with certain patterns, and what they do then is they prefetch that data to hide the latency to the main memory, so we get that it's already there when we go to need it. And if we follow those sort of three bets, it actually starts to matter. So let's dig into this and see how can this matter. So if I'm gonna implement a model, I wanna go back to design basics and what do I need to think about? Two of the very important concepts are coupling and cohesion. Most people will have heard of them, but do you really understand them? Do you practice them every day? This is the sort of really interesting things. That if we're going to get good at our craft, these are the things we have to start thinking about. One simple example I have of this is where I look at many objects, and they're effectively just a properties bag. It's just where somebody went and stuck that property to do a requirement at a given point in time. And there's certain things that start to stand out. So who's heard of a design pattern called Feature Envy? I heard of it? A few hands? Well, what Feature Envy is, is if I have two objects, one object is constantly asking for fields from another object to do its own work. It's, it's envious of the features that are in this other object. It basically is telling you that you have a coupling problem. Some fields that are over here should be over here. And if you look at where do things get access, if the majority of accesses are actually from another object rather than within the object itself, you have a problem. You'll see this in code with things like train racks with dot, 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 all these sorts of things. You see about sort of tell, don't ask as different patterns. There's loads of really interesting code smells that are out of there. When you start getting coupling and cohesion right in a model, so fields are where they're actually used, they're even better if they're well encapsulated inside there so there's good information hiding. What you'll tend to do is you've got things spatially together. They'll also tend to be temporarily together as they get pulled through the cache. You get the benefits of that. One of the things I love to do on projects when I'm learning the code base is just go around it, sort out a lot of the coupling issues, making things more cohesive, and as a result, the code becomes easier to understand, easier to work with, easier to maintain and usually always a good bit faster. I find by just going through some of those exercises, I've typically got a 30 to 40% uh, increase in throughput or reduction in response time just by making those sorts of simple changes as you get to understand the code base. So it kind of screams out that we really need to think a lot about our coupling and cohesion. And so if we start respecting that locality of reference, this starts to really matter. And as our hardware moves further and further forward, those three bets that are there on how our memory subsystems work are becoming stronger all of the time because our caches have become such the critical part of how our hardware works. Now, here's a kind of interesting one. I see lots of different languages, and where languages are going in the future starts to really tell how aware they are of some of these issues. So if you're going to hit your L1 cache, you're typically talking three to four cycles. If you get a miss and you go to main memory, you're typically looking at around 100 nanoseconds in that sort of order. With some queuing of facts, that's what it will typically be. Your best case scenario might be down at the, sort of around the 65 to 70 nanoseconds, but you're typically looking at around about 100 per cache miss. Whereas that's only one nanosecond hitting L1 if you're running at three gigahertz. So that's two orders of magnitude difference. So you've got to get these things working well together. What is a good test for some of this? The way I like to think about it is you've got to keep things together particularly. And so I kind of got a question for most people who are implementing languages is, can you implement an efficient B plus tree in your language? If you can't, you really need to think about where the hardware's going in the future because your language is not going to scale up. It's one of the kind of litmus tests. And why do I pick something like a B plus tree? Because the reason relational databases become successful at the end of the 80s was the discovery of the B plus tree, because an operation to disk was such an expensive thing. So you wanted to get as much work done for one of those operations as possible. So you pulled in a block of data. It's the same now as we access memory. We need to pull in a cache line, and we need to have as much in that cache line as possible. So if you've got a tree that's implemented memory, if it's a binary tree, you're going to have far too many steps to get to your end point. If it's an N-way tree, like a B plus tree or a B star tree or a B tree, you can have many 
steps reduced by that by going much wider, much faster. It suits these things much better. We need to start thinking this way. There's loads and loads of great examples of this and how if we don't do this, we're basically leaving two orders of magnitude of performance on the table for anything that's in memory. And this comes down to its relationships. We need relationships to work well between the different objects we have. And we need to think about this. There's like other skills we need to think about. So I spend a lot of time in finance. I look a lot at financial orders. So these orders rest on order books. Most people may draw a simple line, but does that tell you enough about what's going on? If we dig into this, well, there's actually two relationships there. There's bids and offers, and they're one to many. They're also always qualified on price, and they tend to be ordered and have FIFO semantics. So taking the time to actually understand the relationships tells you so much about which data structures you should use to implement that. Everything isn't just a list and a map. There's many more interesting data structures, and these are really useful things that will stay with you for your whole career. So major pro tip on this is really get back to studying data structures, learn much more about them. Like you could learn loads of different frameworks now, and it might be valid for you for this year. It might be valid next year. If you happen to program in JavaScript, it'll be out of date by next week. If you learn about data structures, they will be with you for your entire career. Because we get advances, but they tend to build on what's there. These are kind of some of the fundamental building blocks of our discipline, a bit like the fundamental building blocks of physics that we have in other sciences and stuff. So we need to think about that. Is there any other things in this? Well, I think batching is another one of those subjects. And the key to batching is all about amortizing the expense of costs. There's a number of things that we have to do that are just expensive. We're going to go to desk, we're going to go to main memory, we're going to go to another machine. If you're going to do one of those operations, let's get as much work done as possible. That way we can amortize that cost and do better from it. Like, so what's a simple example of this? So let's say we go back to that logging framework problem. So in our logging framework, if we go to like write to desk and let's say we weren't going to lose anything, we are in a situation where we got a queue to access that contended resource. So let's say I had 10 threads wanting to write at the same time. The problem I'll end up having is one will arrive first with all the rest arriving behind it. We end up with a perfect queue there. And the average response time is going to be five units of whatever time it takes to write down to that that becomes a major problem. So you get one thing at one unit of time and one right up to 10 units of time with a full distribution between that. And that's kind of not a great response from a system. It's also a kind of bad experience depending on where you turn up in the queue. Let's look at this from a batching approach instead. So let's say many of the things turn up at the same time. You write them into some sort of data structure and you have a separate thread that's batching those down to the underlying storage. The worst case scenario is whenever the 10 turn up, the batcher picks up only one to begin with and then it comes back and it picks up the other nine and writes them down. The entire thing is completed in two units of time with an average of less than two units of time. And that's the worst case scenario. We get much better performance out of this. How does this play out when we design our system? So the red was the queuing theory effect that we've seen from before. If you build systems with batching into the design right through it, you tend to get the blue line. I find that they, I spend a lot of time in high-frequency trading and other high-performance things, and if you want to win against other people, you typically win by just being better than them. And the algorithms often matter more than anything else. So applying things like batching techniques, because we get burst scenarios. The real world is full of burst scenarios, and then we end up winning. So you can achieve the blue line from response time and also get much better throughput through your system. So go back and study batching. Batching isn't just about you wait for a timeout and do stuff. There's lots of ways we can look at algorithms and do things in batches. And as a result, we can get much more out of it. Branches, branches, branches. We have branches everywhere in our code. It makes our code hard to understand. Like, how many times have we seen just pages of stuff on a screen that's sort of indented many deep with all sorts of layers to that? 
All of that stuff, every time you get the for, an if, a while, a do, whatever case statement in your code, you have a branch. And our processors are trying to make as much progress as possible, and they speculate. If they see a branch and they don't have the data to know should they go left or go right at this given point in time, they will speculate based upon some history that they have stored. And if their history is good, they've predicted well. And they'll go forward and continue executing code, and then they'll find out whether their bet was right. If their bet was right, it was great, they've made progress. If their bet was wrong, they've got to throw it away and start again. So just even unwinding a branch is typically about 15 cycles on a modern processor, but that can have other impacts on how much architectural state you've used, different buffers. It can also just be generally worse in how this ends up working. So we really don't want to have too many branches in our code. We often learn by following inference on everything. There's much more we can do with mathematics, which is a huge subject on its own. But let's look at just some really simple stuff. Like I see lots of code like this, where we just want to do some work, and people actually start off with the best of intentions to make something more efficient. Well, I'll check if the thing's empty, and if it's empty, it won't actually do anything. Oh, but I've also got to check for null, because people pass nulls around our code. Like, seriously, this is 2016. It's nearly the end of it. We've got to stop using nulls in our code. Let's get over some of that. Like, get rid of code like this, and just keep it simple. You should be passing in something that's either empty, or it's got stuff in it and deal with them both the same way, because typically you're going to have stuff to deal with. Keep your code simple, keep it clean, start working with things like that. There's loads of examples of branches, and I could go on for days on this alone, just different examples on it, but just start thinking about your code. Start thinking, about, do you really need all of those branches? Because it gets hard to read, hard to understand. And generally, Respect the principle of least surprise. Like People shouldn't be throwing nulls and stuff into there. Let's try to be a bit cleaner with some of our code. A much bigger subject is loops. We spend a huge amount of time in our code. I've seen all sorts of studies that say sort of 70 or 80% of the time that's spent in our code is spent inside loops when we're not doing I.O. And I think this statement is really very relevant to it. So many people think of the mark Twain comment, well, it actually goes back to further before Mark Twain believes Pascal and Old French is the first case I've seen of this. But the statement is like, if I'd had more time, I'd have written a shorter letter. And this is so true. It so applies to our code as well. Now, what do I mean about this? And like, how can we get it? Like, if you go and write anything, like write an email, write a book, write a blog, write a code, whatever, we will pour out of our heads onto whatever medium we're going to record this. And we'll do a reasonable job of it, maybe. But if we leave it some time and come back to it again, we can always refine. We can always do things better. We can make it cleaner, more elegant. And particularly, you can't just do this straight away, because there's an interesting thing that happens inside our heads, that if you write something now and you go read it straight away to review it, you basically replay it from the cache in your own short-term memory, and you don't truly read what you put on the page. You need to leave it a period of time, come back again, and then you truly reread it. When you do that, you'll see things that you didn't see before. You'll see mistakes, but you'll also see many ways of making things cleaner and more elegant. And by making things cleaner and more elegant, we can get code that's easier to maintain, but also code that's much faster. And like, how do we do this? Well, we need to start thinking about how we work and change how we work. We don't just do a piece of work and then move on and never go back and revisit. We need to be doing a piece of work and allowing time to go back and revisit lots of what we do. I've seen how some great academics have many papers on the go at a time. They're delivering at a great rate, but what they're doing is they're taking a bit longer in the gestation period for that, and eventually you're getting stuff going out after it's been reread and reviewed many times. It ends up being much, much better. Why does this really matter from a hardware perspective? Well, behind our level one cache even, we have a level zero cache in our processors. Many people are not even aware of this. And that is a cache of our decoded instructions. So our x86 are kind of high level macro ops. Our processors don't work on those. They work on lower level micro op instructions. So they have to be decoded. And that decoding takes a lot of energy. So if we can stay within that decoded cache for many of our loops, 
things are much lower on energy. They also tend to be faster and more efficient. They also work better with our branch predictors. So keeping our loops small and elegant really helps this. And we're typically looking at 1,500 plus micro operations. That's not 1,500 lines of code. It's a much, much smaller amount than that. But keeping things small and elegant really starts to matter. It even goes further than that. Slightly further back in our processors, there's the instruction dispatch queue. And that queue is typically only 28 micro ops per thread that's going through that. And if we have really nice, small, little, elegant loops, they fly through this part of the processor. So like running over an array or doing a summation with only a few branches maybe in that code. That sort of stuff fits really nicely in there. So keeping stuff really clean and simple works really nicely with our hardware. And we can find that we're tripping over some of these thresholds as ways of measuring it using CPU performance counters to get that. So the, the major point of this is we need to craft all of our major loops. We treat them like pros, make them clean, make them elegant, make them simple. And by doing that, we end up with much cleaner code. So it's kind of respect the single responsibility principle. Like we shouldn't be just jamming another bit of code into some existing code just to meet a requirement in a hurry. That will cost us. We will get bitten by that. Keeping it clean and simple is actually one of the better ways of keeping it much faster and much easier to test. And then we compose all of this stuff. So if we're going to make things small, we're going to make them elegant, we've got to think about composition. And the best way to think about this is think about the, keeping the size small but also the semantic footprint as well as the physical footprint of it. Because if we have things that do one thing and do, does it well and is not coupled to its context, it's so much easier to reuse, it's easier to compose with other things. And this starts to really matter with our compilers and especially in things like our managed runtimes. Like, great uh, quote from Cliff Click before, he said that inlining is the optimization. So if we make things nice and small, they inline really well and our money's runtimes can make the inlining decisions based upon data of what they're actually seeing. So we can have lots of nice little small methods that will get inlined and combined to give the ideal code for the data that we're running through it. If we make things big monsters, they're not good for inlining. They don't suit this sort of thing. So but when it inlines, all of that function call overhead's gone at that stage, and we can let the runtime make these decisions based upon the right thing. That means we have to really focus on single responsibility. So start thinking about one statement, one thing, one method, one thing, one class, one thing, one module, one thing. Just if we keep things really simple and focused, it's very easy to make it optimized and perfect for what it's doing. And with these small atoms, we can pose them up to make really interesting things. Probably the biggest thing you can take away from this is really thinking about our APIs. This is the thing that I find makes the biggest difference to almost anything. The wrong API limits so many of your design decisions behind that. If you get the API right, it enables so much. Now, I spend a lot of my time doing networking code. And that means, unfortunately, I have to deal a lot with NIO. So if I want to read, from a socket with NIO, the code is actually pretty horrid. So what have we got here? It's like, I want to select now from a selector. Then I'm going to get the key set of what's available. I'm going to iterate over that. I'm going to then see if any of that data is readable, and then process it. And then I've got to remove it at the end of it. Like, th this is pretty nasty. It makes my eyes bleed even looking at this. And particularly, it causes so much allocation it imposes ways of working on the calling code. You could do this very, very differently if you think about it from a different API perspective. So like particularly looking at how things like the selection keys are done there and then all of the boilerplate we've got to do with iterating over this. So let's say you pass in the collection rather than return the collection. Just taking that difference in design approach means, hey, I can reuse my collection as much as I want. I can choose what collection I use for that. And I select now, and I pass in the set of keys that gets populated. I can even provide a filter, and then I can for each over it. Now, people say this looks like functional programming, and it's kind of great that we're getting this way with Java 8, but we could have done this at the very beginning. 
We need to be thinking about APIs that do this because now we've got choices over what data structures. We don't have to have as much allocation. We can control this around much better spatial locality. Just thinking about the API, there's loads and loads of examples to this. And I find one of the fundamentals in the design is, is you give the caller the choice. The mindset should not be that your caller is dumb and you're going to impose a way of working on them. If the mindset is, how do I enable the caller to do things how they would like to, they can choose the collections, they can choose how they're going to process this afterwards. It makes it so much cleaner. So it's a kind of mindset and cultural change. We, you got to think about enablement. It ends up with nice, cleaner code. It also ends up with code that's much faster. So how we think about this starts to really matter going forward. We also have to deal with a lot of data. And typically, data is really just big tables of stuff. Now, we could implement this in a number of ways in your typical OO language. What it'll end up being is an array of objects, and those objects are randomly all over the heap. And we've got some interesting issues that we don't play well with our memory subsystems. Well, how can we deal with this differently, especially when we start looking at filtering, searching, finding, doing all sorts of interesting jobs across this? If you just change how you think about the data, so rather than having a pile of objects, how about having a collection of arrays where each one of those res represents a field within what would have been those objects? So we start looking at data in a different way. And if they're all just a res, it opens up some really interesting things where we can go down and search the whole array. We now apply well with the memory subsystems that we were thinking about before we can start doing cool things like vectorization. This is where the processor can pr do the same instruction over multiple items of data at the same time and be fed through at really, really high rates. We can get much more interesting instruction level parallelism out of our processors if we program to them different. And if you want to see, well, what is the whole object view at a given stage? Well, we just treat it as Everything across that index is kind of there. We can do these things right now with all of our modern languages. Start thinking in columns as well as rows. There's many dimensions in which we can look at a problem, but we just start thinking about it. And that way we can deal with these things in a different way. What does this fundamentally come down to is start embracing many different paradigms. You may be comfortable with OO. Start looking at functional. Look at set theory. Set theory is one of those great overlook subjects. There's so much goodness in set theory that works really well when we're doing any work on data. So much of the applications we write are effectively just queries against given data. And we start thinking about how do we deal with them as sets? There's so much more we can do. So how do we start sort of pulling this together and how do we test it? Well, if we're going to start caring about performance, the first thing we've got to think about is, well, what are the goals we're trying to set? Like, so what will be a good performance goal for our software? Don't just say, I want something to be faster. Target, I want a given throughput, and I want to have a response time at different levels of throughput. And that way, you can kind of start driving this. And also know when you're done. Like, knowing how fast something is doesn't mean you take action against it to optimize it or whatever, but knowing what it can give you starts to become really important. I think it's, it's actually a responsibility of us as an industry becoming more grown up and professional. We know what our software is capable of dealing with. If I was designing a bridge and I didn't know how many cars could drive across it, that would be a bit irresponsible. A building and you don't know how many people it can deal with or how quickly you can evacuate it. But most people have no clue at which point their software is going to break. Just knowing that is a really useful thing. So typically, we need to start measuring. And we want to measure things like response time. People will use things like averages. And averages are so misleading. If we capture, say, in a histogram, where what I've got here is the number of observations at a given response time, I'm plotting it out like that, what does this start to tell us? Well, Let's start applying averages. What's the mode in here? So mode being the most common occurrence, that's reasonably useful, tells me something. Median, where does that fit in? Well, if we line everything all up and we take the midpoint of the line, we end up here of observations, not telling me so much. The mean, which is typically what most people think about an average, actually doesn't tell me anything useful here at all. So this is a system that I'm putting transactions into and my mean response time is coming out giving me a figure that's not very useful. 
it doesn't tell me what is the most common case we're dealing with. It also doesn't tell me why have I got these outliers over here that are taking quite a long time and really throwing off my averages. We've got to stop measuring in averages. We've got to capture histograms of stuff. So we want quantile or percentile distributions of our data. It gives us a much, much better view of what's going on. And we also got to be careful that we don't get tricked. So if we just measure service time, and that's like the time within our application to do a job, it hides a whole pile of issues. It particularly hides the fact that queues are forming outside of our system. So say, for example, your system is taking a long GC pause. That's not stopping the customer sending requests in. Those requests are all building up in the network buffer and just waiting on your system. You'll be deluding yourself thinking, well, I'm fairly responsive. I've only got a few requests that didn't take so long. You're not accounting for all of those queued up requests. And so you're emitting things. Look up coordinated emission. It's a kind of really interesting subject that describes some of the problems here. Capture this stuff, put it in histograms. We should be histogramming all of our major services. So every service, we should be capturing what are our response times, what are our cycle times. We'll do all of the different service times that we have inside this, this way we can start plugging into queuing theory to know what's going on. If we want to start testing it, we've got great tools out there now. Things like JMH will let us run micro benchmarks, but also much larger benchmarks and run them repeatedly and plug them into really nice profilers that help us know with what's going on. Those profilers now can go down to great levels of detail. We can see inside our CPU, seeing branch misses, cache misses, so the predicts, the unpredicts, all sorts of really interesting things about our CPUs. We can start getting experimental evidence that tells us what is going on, and then we can have our theories tested on this, and we can improve things. Once you get this going, put it in the continuous integration. We should be doing this all of the time. CI should be a constant thing that's running, and so we should be failing if we get big regressions. The really important thing about putting this into CI is when we have a regression, we know straight away, we know what the cause was that caused the regression. Just like we know when we functionally break something, it's good to know when we end up introducing a performance issue. We can go straight to it. We know the costs of different things. Probably much more interesting is, what do we do with our live systems? We should have telemetry in our live systems as a first-class thing. And by this, what I mean is we should have things that in real time we can introspect a system without impacting it, without slowing it down, without causing any other bad effects to see how well it's, it's doing at any given point in time. I'll make that point again. Please build telemetry into your live systems. If you look at other disciplines, so I'm a huge petrol head. I love motor racing. The reason it's got so good is because of testing and telemetry and getting that measurement back. There's so much time is spent on that. There's lots can be learned. Well, what would that look like for our own code? Well, we should be capturing queue lengths. We should have queues explicit, and we should capture them. We should know things like what level of concurrency we're experiencing. We should be capturing things like exceptions and not just putting them into the log, making sure we track this all really well, and keep counters of all of the things that are really, really interesting. The nice thing about working on some open source stuff is I can put out examples of showing this. So if you're interested in seeing well, what does this mean, well, I happen to have worked on a messaging system called Aeron, and it's got a system counters section in it, and it keeps counters of everything, all important state, happens to get written in a way that's so easy to introspect, so easy to observe what's going on. That helps us get a lot of performance, but it also really helps with debugging and understanding what's going on in the system, because it's not a black box anymore then. Same with their histograms. So capture encounters of real-time stuff, maybe sample those, put them into histograms. And then we can start getting, well, OK, I may have a good average, but what is the distribution looking like on that? How do we get that sort of stuff right? So now to kind of wrap this up, we covered a lot of material. What are the major takeaways here? Well, think from a clean code perspective, we've got to stop thinking about how do we contaminate it with loads of stuff. It's also we want it simpler. We want to have a lot less code that we've got to deal with, and that way we can make it much, much faster, much cleaner, and much easier to deal with. I think good performance is based upon just some really sound design fundamentals. These are just good things we should be practicing. These are the things that we should be practicing every day so that it becomes second nature. 
we should, you shouldn't be questioning things like, if I'm going to pass an object from one thing to another, do I pass the whole object? Do I just pass what I need? Think about the levels of coupling. These sorts of things start to really matter. And you can see this in code. You get to the point where you see code and you know it will do really well. Very similar case was Bill Lear, who built the Learjet. He had a great expression that if it looks good, it will fly good. I think it's very similar with code. You can tell code that looks nice, and it's nice and simple and elegant and to the point, and it tends to perform well, it tends to be robust, it tends to do what it needs to do. When it's hugely complicated and, and hugely contorted, it tends to not be good on any of those sort of fronts, so we want to keep it really, really simple. And on that, I'm nearly out of time. I have five minutes left. I'll happily take questions if anyone's got any, or I'll let you all run away. So thank you. Okay, question. Yeah, this uh, micro code, yeah? Mm -hmm. We have like uh, now two diff uh, three different levels. We have like JVM code, then we translate to, uh, that to machine code, and then to micro code. Should we desire that we skip one step and that we have, uh, uh, you know, uh, risk CPUs again? <laughs> Kind of good question. So we've got many levels of microcode, like be it bytecode, be it assembly, be it microcode. Should we look at skipping them? Maybe, maybe not. I think if we do, we should do it based upon measurement. I don't think our issues are at some of that level at the moment. There's probably an issue around energy required for some of the decoding steps, but I th personally, I would do it based upon measurement. Okay, thank you.